everybody. Uh, thanks so much for coming. I couldn't be more delighted to be having a conversation with these two incredible artists and women, Simone Lee and Lorraine O'Grady, um, on the occasion of this um, kind of marathon of talks that we're doing here at the New Museum. I'm gonna jump right in because I was told we had 45 minutes, but it said 43, so we've already lost some time. Um, I wanted to start actually by talking a little bit um, about history, our own histories and your histories, both um, as individuals as, and as friends um, and colleagues. So I met you, Lorraine, after I wrote um, a review in 2008 of a show that you did um, that impacted me greatly, and, and you were kind enough to immediately reach out and we became friends, which is a success story for any young critic writing, um, and so I've continued to follow your work for, Thanks. The, I mean, I knew your work before. Thank you, thank you. This is a really good tactic for young critics, just write about the artists that you really love, um, and sometimes they actually wanna meet you, which is, yeah. which is great. And Simone, um, we've had a really intense couple of years together. Um, Simone worked uh, with the education department and with the museum actually multiple times in the last couple of years. Um, I guess I could start by asking a little bit about your histories um, with the museum, but also with each other. How did you meet? Ooh, Actually, question. yeah, I, I, th I, remember, I remember that um, Simone came up to me after uh, something at another museum uh, and introduced herself. I was okay. presenting that day. That's how you knew who I was. Mm -hmm. I presented. I presented to uh, um, the, the photography department or the performance uh, department at, at MoMA, and uh, Simone was there, and she came up to me, and uh, and I don't. And then the next thing I know is that she was doing something at recess, uh, at a thing called Be Black Baby, and oh she. Wow. And, th th and then she asked me to b do something for it. And since I had just come up this piece where I was working with Michael Jackson, I did something that I thought was pretty cool. I did. It I was did outrageous. It, it was outrageous, actually. <laughs> I did. I did something that was uh, complete uh, called uh, Gold Gold Pants Michael, um, which is Michael wearing. Um, uh, what the, oh. the designer glittery gold pants? The, the guy that got killed in Florida, whatever that guy's name was, oh, right? And, and, yeah, and he had this gold uh, fabric with nothing on under it, and so and and uh, for all that Michael looked sort of small, he actually wasn't, and so that became a big thing for fan for female fandom, was gold pants Michael, and everybody had done all of these videos, and I strung them together for her. <laughs> That's an origin story. Is that how you remember it, Simone? I yeah, very much so, and we were all very shocked. <laughs> the the Be Like Baby party, um, well, that one was uh, called uh, Michael Jackson 2004 because Yuri McMillan did a conference on Michael Jackson right. in 2004, yeah. and yeah. we were like re-performing the conference. So Tavia did his first lecture again, but as karaoke style. And we invited Lorraine, and she did this outrageous thing. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I know she got, they're going to be shocked, right? You know, they've heard <laughs> this little elder stateswoman, right? <laughs> <laughs> Simone, can you talk a little bit about how you came into the art world? Um, well, really reluctantly. Um, I was really focused, I was a philosophy major and also just really interested in cultural studies in college. Um, and I actually thought that the ceramics program at Earlham College where I was was really kind of like the perfect example of Orientalism. And that was my interest when I started working there. And then I became really engaged in, um, I don't know, American studio pottery was really fascinating to me. And I continued to, I just got really curious about different things and about material. And then I did a, a Smithsonian uh, African Art Fellowship internship when I was 19. And I just kept on making things. And at a certain point, I accepted that I was gonna not stop making things. But I kind of resisted, I wanted to be a social worker. Well, we can so talk more about day. how that didn't totally leave your realm, um, kind of intersecting in the, yeah. in the social sphere, not as a social worker, but thinking about some of those questions. Lorraine, you came to the art world late. Very late, yeah. I actually was uh, just about 
six years younger than Simone is now, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, I came uh, because I, um, well, basically, I ha had had a checkered career, but it was all sort of going toward the arts, and then I had uh, uh, gone, gone to, I had gone to the Iowa Writers' Workshop to uh, study fiction, or, you know, writing fiction, and I realized I was not going to be a very good fiction writer, and so I uh, had started teaching at SVA, and then I tried to figure out who are these people that I'm teaching, right, you know, and it turns out that uh, uh, I read, the first b art book that I read actually was uh, uh, Lucifer Part Six Years of the Dematerialization of the Art Object, which is a kind of strange place to start to enter art history. And then I realized, oh, I have ideas like this all the time. I just didn't know they were art. And uh, and then um, I realized that this place that I was teaching in had been a sort of like real uh, venue for uh, conceptual and performance art, the SVA Auditorium and so forth. And everybody had been teaching there. And so right upstairs, uh, Vito Acconci was right teaching. And um, I went in and I sat in on a class of his. And then I came downstairs and I said, okay, if he can do it, I can do it. <laughs> you know, he was a poet. I was a fiction writer. He would, he'd gone to the Iowa Writers' Workshop. I'd gone to the Iowa Writers' work, Writers Workshop. If you can just announce that you're an artist, well, then you are. Can you talk about some of the earliest work that you did, including the work um, that has a kind of famous history here at the New Museum? I'm sorry? Do you want to give us a little insight to some of your earliest work, including um, some of the work that premiered here at okay. the New Museum? <laughs> well, I actually, uh, I actually say that when I started, I did a piece. Of, um, the piece that I, st I start, I started a piece as an art, as a as a writer, and ended it as more of a visual artist. And that was uh, this piece that I did called "Cutting Out the New York Times." Right, it was collaging and finding my, making that public language private, finding myself through that language, and um, and. Uh, Right now, I've just sort of cannibalized that piece and done a brand new piece to sort of reflect who I am now. Uh, but I say that, that uh, cutting out the New York Times was the last moment when I was speaking with a post-black voice because I had never been anywhere where my intelligence or my capacities had been questioned before until I got to the art world. And so when I sort of... Uh, 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 I, I volunteered for Just Above Midtown, and uh, somehow or the other, I realized this situation is untenable, this absolute segregation of the art world. And I just was not in any mood to you know, sit still for that. So I did this piece called Mademoiselle Bourgeois and, Noir. Uh, and it was going to Just Above Midtown and doing this piece that uh, converted me into what I would call a black artist, not an artist who happens to be black. And it's my understanding that that performance was a critique not only of the white art world, but of the black art world as well. When you performed it at Just Above Midtown, that was also... Yes, I, I did it first at Just Above Midtown because I felt that people had gotten into a position where they were really sort of like uh, making art with white gloves on in the sense that it was very well done, very well done. And, um, and I felt that... I felt that what was needed at that moment was art that was rougher around the edges, and that's why performance had attracted me. Uh, uh, but it's not to say that I don't respect artists who express their political understanding of the world through abstract art. There are many fine artists that do, but I just felt that at that moment, what was really needed was, you know, just let it all hang out, you know? Can you describe the reaction at each of the venues? Oh, okay. <laughs> so then the, the following year, um, uh, I, I was invited by uh, the education department of the new museum to uh, do the, uh, uh, school, uh, the school children outreach about a, a show that was just opening called Persona. And it was not, I called it the nine white Persona show. <laughs> Because, and uh, I said, okay, uh, th there was a young man whose name I've sort of forgotten, I hate to say it, but he was in charge of it, and uh, of, the, uh, of the education department at that moment. And I said, okay, but uh, let me think about it. Let's talk after the opening. Because I knew that I was going to go to that opening, and, 
And poor Marsha Tucker had gone off on a vacation. And so this young guy who made his own decisions and he disinvited me from doing the outreach. I have nothing, I have, I wish I could change that, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So, Simone, actually, you know, this question of performance comes up in both of your work, and um, I'm curious if you have been thinking, I, I was reading an artist statement that you wrote recently where you talk about yourself as being primarily a sculptor, a maker. Um, how have you been thinking recently about having to define yourself in one way or another? I mean, I think about the work you've done here and the way in which it's impossible for me to think about you in any one register, but I do see these distinct parts, parts of what you do you do. So upstairs on the fourth floor are these incredibly beautiful sculptures, but they were activated during the opening um, via performance. Um, can you speak a little bit about that? I partially ask because, uh, I'll get back to this in a moment, how we're recording these histories, including um, uh, Mademoiselle uh, Bourgeoisie, or Bourgeois, um, you know, becomes part of history. And I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about your practice in relationship to making and, and performance. Um, well, I think that I've been thinking recently that I can really map um, my career in an interesting way if I just focus on relationships. And the reason why I ended up doing um, the Free People's Medical Clinic, which was a reenactment of the Black Panther Party's Free People's Medical Clinic, is because Rashida asked me to. And I really like trusted her that it was something that I would be able to accomplish because of my um, you know, I, because of our relationship. And um, so I did it, but I felt like very uncomfortable about having my sculpture there. Um, and the same thing happened with the waiting room here because uh, I didn't want to feel that um, the sculpture was somehow decorating something else. Mm -hmm. um, so I've tried to keep the two bodies of work very separate. Um, and I think that the Signs and Grips show, um, which is actually informed by um, the United Order of Tents, which is um, the secret society of black women that have been um, doing different kinds of work for each other since um, the Civil War. So they had their 150th anniversary celebrations this year and I went. And so um, I've been thinking about them and letting the, um, the things I've been learning from them like kind of like seep into the work. And, um, but I still feel like that my relationship to performance is somewhat, I don't know, that I come at it from the side. <coughs> It's interesting when you were talking about your kind of early formation as an artist um, and the way that you came to ceramics through this idea of Orientalism. You recently mentioned um, an idea um, that I think pertains a little bit to Lorraine speaking about how and whether black art is presented in museums. Um, and you, you mentioned a phrase that you've been thinking about, which is black Orientalism, black on black Orientalism. Black on black Orientalism. Can you speak a little <laughs> bit about that? Um, I think in the current um, climate, it would be really interesting to hear? Um, well, I, you know, am like a amateur Africanist, and um, that's just because that's what was necessary for my sculpture. And um, if you really think about these uh, objects, many of which have been like, are sort of located in Europe now, and um, the issues around repatriation, the uh, nomenclature, like the categories that they're situated and the way they're displayed. Um, none of these things even come close to what we would feel was like an authentic um, understanding. So I've always had this real, especially because I was at the Smithsonian when I was 19, I have this sense of um, how fraudulent the information is that I might have. So I've never felt comfortable with this um, sense of ownership of a certain culture and, you know, um, I think also being from the West Indies, there's a, a sort of uh, comfor comfort you have with the idea of creolization, um, which might be actual cultural appropriation depending on the way you think about it. 
um, before we came in, we were talking about, um, it was actually a little bit, my heart stopped, because Lorraine said, Johanna, we feel really uncomfortable about 30 <laughs> seconds before we came out. And I thought, oh God, what, what did I do? But in fact, um, it was interesting. It was a discomfort around what is a very intimate and, and long-term conversation that the two of you have had, and what does it look like to bring that public? And I think that's always a really interesting conversation when, when artists are having talks about their work and their mutual kind of engagement. But you made a comment about um, your shared roots in the Caribbean, but how different those roots are because of the different sort of time periods that your families um, uh, lived there. So I wondered if you'd talk a bit about that. I think it's, it's interesting. Well, I mean, I think obviously I'm 33 years older than, uh, than Simone. So <laughs> it's not obvious, So there are lots of things. It's not obvious. So there are lots of things we can't share. Uh, um, but um, the things that we do share uh, are so very important to both of us, I think. And uh, we don't often get opportunities to speak about them. And in some ways, there's a sort of subtle pressure not to speak about them. And so we've n not spoken about them publicly yeah. as much as we might. Um, but um, I had to make a very difficult decision. I don't, I, I'm not sure how Simone feels about this. We haven't talked about it exactly in these terms. But I have had to make a difficult decision, which is to say that if I'm going to deal with myself uh, authentically, I don't like that word, but you know what I mean. If I'm going to deal with the issues that I'm actually having to deal with and deal with in my work, both, both personally and in my work, I have to be able to actually deal with them. And so I, I can't pretend that I'm something that I'm not. I can't pretend that I share the, uh, the, the uh, African-American, basically Southern uh, black experience. I have to understand that so many of the problems that I'm dealing with are the fact that my parents came to the United States from this crazy uh, colonial situation with all of these you know, crazy ideas in their head about how the fact that they were light-skinned made them better than everybody else and all of that. All of this which was uh, inculcated in them as a way of ruling that island, you understand? And, I, uh, and, um, and so I have to talk about the way in which I had to fight against my parents and the way feel sympathy for them, and um, and then I have to deal with the fact that I myself don't ever feel fully uh, comfortable in a situation where I'm expected to share things that I don't share, and yeah. and so forth. So, so for me, I've had to gradually, and very gradually, because I feel that it's politically difficult, uh, accept my situation as a basically Caribbean American artist, and that's uh, so. So Lorraine's family came here from Jamaica in the teens, yeah. mm -hmm. and my family came in the 50s. Um, so um, Lorraine was raised in the Anglican church, and by the time my family came, my father came here as a Nazarene minister, which is like a um, American Bible Belt um, fundamentalists, like, um, and so those things reflect what happened to the island in that period of time. Um, and we have met maybe 20, I don't know, 30 <laughs> times at the islands, which is the best Jamaican <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> right, we have, we have to eat our jerk chicken and our whatnot. <laughs> like, maybe once a month, and then when they close, they're closed temporarily. Uh, Lorraine doesn't come to see me anymore. <laughs> no, because not there's true. no jerk, <laughs> no jerk chicken, so. But, um, so we have a lot of, um, we have a lot to talk about. Yeah, I think that when, you know, I was trying to think before we came about like, what it was to say that like, uh, Simone and I shared, and in the conversations that we had, I cannot tell you what a relief it was to feel, to find out that she had experienced something that I had had. And that something uh, that I don't know, immigrant kids of every kind probably do face. But that moment when you're about 14 years old and you look at your parents and you realize that no matter how smart and well educated they are, they don't have a clue. They don't have a clue, and you're on your own. You have to like negotiate this new this world, figuring it out for yourself because they can't really help you. Yeah. 
and Samoa is the only zero person zero cultural I capital. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Samoa is the first person I've ever been able to have that conversation with, really. It's been great. I mean, I, I used to and still continue to talk about having a black woman audience, and this is one of the reasons why, like, there's, um, you know, signs, objects, uh, histories that you share that you want to be able to um, bring in as discourse in your work, and it's hard to do that when you're the only one. When you, when we came together as a group to talk about your presenting um, an iteration of the clinic here, you were really explicit about um, your desires to stage that project in a museum. Can you talk a little bit to this point? Um, you know, there was a way in which I think really generously you you named an audience, but you also understood that it would be an audience within another audience, and it would mm. be very different in that sense than the first um, presentation. Um, yeah, what made you want to do it here? I'm curious. Well, you had asked me, and so I thought, can I do it here? Um, and um, I feel that it became maybe more spectacle than I would have liked. Um, but one of the ways I mitigated it was uh, a blade of grass gave me a grant. So I did another kind of shadow program while the museum was closed with, was it 15? It was Emily, she would be able to tell me, with 15 girls. So they came here and they had, you know, classes in herbalism and um, Kiaru. Uh, Watanabe did um, taiko drumming and they made their own drums and this all happened and then also um, I felt really good about the fact that none of it was recorded. So um, that's the way I sort of mitigated my uncomfortableness about who the audience was and what the work was actually for. Yeah, I mean it was an, such a great discussion over many months about how to sort of change existing structures um, and how certain folks are called upon to change those structures in, in sometimes, I think, kind of unfair ways. Um, I mean, I think it's also interesting in asking you about your backgrounds, I have a question, I, I wonder how much to actually ask about biography because it's often um, required that it becomes part of the work and the presentation of self. But I think in both of your work, you've taken this on directly um, within the, the kind of fabric of what you've presented. Um, so it's interesting to kind of think about that. What research are you each working on now? What What's next? You want to go first? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put it on you. Um, I'm working on a, I'm trying to find a playwright to help me um, create a um, episode of MASH recast with black women. <laughs> so that's what I'm working on. Wow. <laughs> so much more interesting than I need a comedy right that. now. Uh, well, I, I'm I'm actually um, I've just finished this thing this summer where I sort of cannibalized an old work and it's the last I'm ever going to do of that. Um, and I'm working on a new performance, and it's a performance that I can't talk about, and so it's really really hard. Oh no. Because if I, I feel that if I feel that nobody knows. I feel that if Mademoiselle, I feel that if uh, Mademoiselle Bourgeois were, if anybody had known she was coming, right. neither she nor I would still be here, mm -hmm. right? So this new performance character is a, has a similar problem. You can't know she's coming. Is she coming here? And like the problem, <laughs> the, and the problem is, the problem is that I have to think about it all myself, and that's really hard because it I really hard. want to talk to people yeah. and get their advice and so forth. So I'm going to make all these mistakes and then. So Pick did you, later. did nobody know about Mademoiselle Bourgeois? No. Nobody knew? No, no, absolutely not. That's, an ama that's amazing. We talked a little bit, but I want to return to this idea of documenting performance, which I know you've thought a lot about. Yeah. And yeah. what gets circulated and then what the kind of history around performance is. Um, you mentioned in some notes that you sent that you've spent a lot of your career correcting people's assumptions about work. Um, yeah. Can you talk about that a bit? Well, I, you know, I think I became a performance artist mainly because I had the confidence of public speaking. I'd been doing it since I was about 10. You know, I was on the debate teams and so forth all through high school. And, um, and I, I had a very naive idea about what performance was, do you know what I mean, based on that. And then I realized that 
you have to actually take pictures. You have to do, you know, you have to take videos. You have to do, and so forth. And then I was, uh, it, when I first did these performances in 19, early 1980s, uh, performance was not supported that in that way. People thought I was crazy, you know, why was I doing this? And I was crazy because I was spending all of my own money. Uh, and so I didn't have, the m I didn't have money to, uh, to do a live performance uh, and a video of it, you know, that was, the equipment at that time was so prohibitively expensive, I have no videos of my work, none. And uh, so I'm stuck with this uh, photo documentation, which I didn't take, but others you know, supplied. And, um, and how to make this work as a representation of the experience. And I realized that there is absolutely no way that even the best video can give the viewer the feeling of what it was like to be there. It's a fantasy that that's possible. And so as a result, to bring a, 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 a performance that happened, you know, however long ago it was, into the present tense, you have to actually uh, recreate it in a new format, which is the format of the documentation. And so my old, and what I discovered when I started to do this was that the documentation and the works that I was making out of the performance were so much better and more interesting than the performances that I had done that at first I would be afraid to like admit that, but now I'm very proud of that fact. Uh, but I think that, I think that uh, you still run up against curators and, and others who feel if they don't have the original you know, slide or the original whatever, that they don't get getting the real thing. But trust me, that has nothing to do with reality. So you feel like even in this moment where everyone's documenting everything with 20 cameras, it's not, it's no less of a problem. Maybe even more of a problem. How have you addressed documentation in your work? It's, it's so interesting because the performances that I've seen, and some of them aren't performances, they're just relationships and engagements, can't be documented really at all. Um, how, so have, how have you gone about that? Um, well, most recently with Sharifa, um, Sharifa is a dancer and, and she's you know since become a historian or I'm actually not sure what category she falls into. Um, but mm, she wanted to, I don't know, I, I can't even remember how we started working on that project, but we just started working on it and then we ended up in rehearsals with Rashida. Um, thinking about how to just activate that object. And um, we, you know, we did what came out of those rehearsals. Um, and, and we decided to not do it again. There's many people asked us to do another um, version of it. I think that, I, yeah, it, it, it depends on, um, depends on the, relationship, the context, but also I feel like that pers that, that work has is a kind of relationship to, say, um, the piece I made with Liz Laser and Alicia Hall-Moran. So I do see similarities in retrospect, but when I'm making these pieces, um, I don't think about them that way. Like, I don't think about, um, I don't consciously make plans like that. Well, it's interesting. You're often asked to restage things that come very organically out of a certain context. Yeah. Um, for instance, when you were here at the New Museum, very, um, very much in reaction to what was happening in um, in the current climate, you staged very quickly. You brought together um, over 100 women artists um, as part of Black Lives Matter, um, Black women artists, and you've been asked now hundreds of times to sort of travel that. And in some cases, you, you've done that, but it's kind of taken on a life of its own at this point. Um, can you talk about something like that, a project that starts out very much in relationship to a specific context and then, and then moves or doesn't move? Well, I, I, you know, I'm still processing um, Black Women Artists, and it is still an active organization, but um, I think that a lot of institutions in the art world, one of the ways they're dealing with their um, diversity problems is to invite people of color into the education and public programming. 
Um, and so um, we had decided really early on that we didn't want to like travel the world doing this red performance. Um, and also um, the intensity of that project. I mean, I really, you know, that was not like a part of my work. It was like I opened a door and a group of women made a work. Um, and um, I thought it was really fantastic. And I do think, I think it's really kind of funny actually in art that we've gotten to the point where people want you to um, recreate something they already, you know, like where was the point? So, um, so yeah, I, I think that um, this idea of recreating is like kind of punishing. And it also it's, it's just not um, appropriate when it comes to black bodies a lot of the time, it just isn't, you know. Have you been uh, able to, when you have a conversation where someone offers that or invites you, it, can you say, that's probably not a good idea and here's why? Can we talk about sort of institutional protocol and yeah. I mean, has that proven productive or? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think th the most productive thing is just to say no. Um, and you know, know and explain why. Um, and um, I've been really fortunate. I have had a lot of um, exhibitions um, where my work has been supported and a lot of these, you know, whatever public programming has been sort of in relationship to an exhibition. So, um, but I don't, I didn't want to become someone who's facilitating, you know, this kind of like um, spectacle. I, th I think in general that uh, the whole issue of how um, diversity is achieved through education departments rather than curatorial departments is a big problem, obviously. And um, um, I, I, uh, I mean, I, I actually did something for Simone's uh, sh um, exhibition Absolutely. here. Um, and I cast it in such a way, I thought, that so, so that it would be, my speaking about aging was, I had a very jokey title, I can sometimes do jokes inappropriately, but it called Ask Me Anything About Aging, right? And, uh, and I did it here, and I felt that I could do it safely here, because I could appeal to women aging. I wasn't really like trying to just be a black woman at that moment, I was just being an old woman. Uh, so, <laughs> which I don't know which is kind of more difficult, but whatever. Um, uh, um, I, I I was absolutely shocked out of my mind when uh, other uh, when other museums started asking me to do this, yeah. and I had to say well, no. That was like a part of the, another problem. Yeah. What you know? You don't you don't really get it then if you think yeah. that, that I'm going to go around you know the country doing this this thing that I was doing first of all for Simone first of all for that pro and then second of all for that project yeah you know so this is this is um, something that I think happens to a lot of us a lot more than we would like to have happen but uh, but I th I think I have to say about Simone and I I feel uh, that it takes a certain kind of person to be brave in an institutional situation. And I think that Simone is exemplary in that way. Um, I mean, I think that the, I think that the black women artists for Black Lives Matter uh, um, moment that she took advantage of, which was something happening in the streets and to bring it to back into the museum and to get, and to get support from the museums, you know, that was like extraordinary. And, um, and th Simone was able to do that, I think, uh, because she has got this sort of inner courage, but also because she has the skills. You couldn't do something like a uh, black lives, uh, black women artists, if you didn't have extraordinary networking skills. And that is something, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's true. I wouldn't know a hundred black women to invite, right? You know, but well Simone does. She, I mean, she's just, she's an amazing, she's an amazing networker. Um, uh, she has something to give every artist in the world world in terms of like an understanding of how you figure out what you don't know and who knows it and how to get that get, get that other person into your mental framework so that you can move forward um, when when I um, was trying to organize that event I posted on um, bad news women which uh, Elizabeth Axman started which is a kind of a private fa Facebook group of black women artists 
I know we were really excited also just to um, be able to quickly, um, and because Simone is such a great organizer, um, offer a platform that was so clearly in reaction to contemporary culture. Often it takes years to produce a show, and because Simone was able to do that, um, it also allowed us to showcase the way in which artists want to use platforms sort of to hand over to other groups, um, which felt really moving at that moment. And it changed, it, it sort of changed the feeling of even just the lobby um, area for, for a few hours in a really profound way um, that I think a lot of people in the museum still talk about and are really excited mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm curious to know, because we've touched now on this kind of problem right now of institutions really wanting to open up and have diversity something that's more than just a thing that gets fulfilled in, in insignificant or insufficient ways. Do you feel like progress is being made on those fronts or do you, I mean, today's a sort of bleak day. I woke up and it was like the bill got pushed through and you know, I mean, it's, it keeps feeling like there, there are really hard kind of political um, wrinkles every day that we're learning about, but art feels more important than ever in, in that mm -hmm. um, realm. And I wonder, as folks who've thought about this for a long time and really practically and pragmatically in some senses, um, how you feel about kind of institutional support and the shows that are being made and your own place in art history. I mean, Lorraine, you're actively writing your, your own legacy right now. I mean, it's I'm sorry? you're actively writing kind of the history of your work right yeah. now. Um, yeah. So I, I guess I'd be curious to know when you're looking back, how do things feel? Do you feel like things have, do you want to, do you feel the need to put white gloves on your clothes when you walk <laughs> into well, I, you know, I, I am in a very complicated situation, as you can imagine. I mean, I began my career as, you know, somebody fighting against, and now I'm sort of been embraced by, and so that's like this kind of like not the easiest situation. But um, so that's why I was saying that I, I, I admire Simone so much because she has been able to maintain a, a, a inside outside stance simultaneously in a way that's really. Thank you. No, really, <laughs> no, but it's true. And uh, I, I, I'm trying to uh, negotiate that myself. Um, so um, I, I do find, though, that uh, when I start making objects, uh, and this is new work, it, the, the, the work that I cannibalized from cutting out the New York Times, which is not, not I now call cutting out cutting out the New York Times. Uh, that, when I, f somebody asked me, well, why now? Why are you doing it now? You know, and, and like, what, you know, the whole idea that I would be making objects is like problematic for some people. But you know, you must be able to do both, really. So. That project started in 1977. Hmm? That project began in 1977. Yeah. So it you- It began in 1977 and it, uh, and it uh, began in, uh, um, it began with a, tra a, a phys physiological trauma, uh, which is a female trauma. I had a biopsy that returned negative, and you know, just all of that. So, uh, so then, so as a result, um, and because I was still, you know, post-black, I, I, I didn't. This piece is not at all about uh, blackness. You know, I think I mentioned out of 225 pages of collage, you know, things with the times. I think the word black may have appeared six times in the whole thing. And now that I've redone it, it only appears three or less times, right, you know? Because, uh, and then somebody said to me, well, but gender's still there, you know? Well, I said, well, yeah, I just had a breast biopsy, you know? So, and, I, and all I was thinking about was that getting old was going to, like, cut down my, my sexual possibilities, you understand? So I was really in the midst of being a 43-year-old woman who just had a breast biopsy. How could you not think about sex and gender? You know, so, so in other words, this piece is uh, primarily about gender, I would say, or, but, but more it's just about like this person trying, seeing the world through this new lens, and not, ge not gender, but just everything all together at one time. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that like I, I wonder, you know, well, whether or not the fact that I'm speak so I, I've, redone a piece that was made in a post-black voice in a piece that really is much more of a post-black voice. And who wants to hear that voice? I don't know who on earth wants to hear that voice, you know? I don't think that it's going to be that well received. It will be, may be well received because it's very well done, but you know, 
I don't know. I don't know. It almost sounds like it was ahead of its time and then ahead of its time, or so, you know, there's something right. out of you know, stuff. Right. Mean, you know, everybody knows that identity is like looked down upon. You know, so when you don't yeah. have, when you're not expressing identity, uh, do people really want to hear what you have to say? But you've actually talked about this piece as, in your opinion, your most successful work, even though it has in many ways been the most misinterpreted. Simone, do you have a piece that you feel that way about that was personally really satisfying and you returned to, but but maybe, or, or what was, what's your most satisfying work? What have you been the most excited about? Maybe it doesn't have to also be a failure. Maybe you're just <laughs> excited about it. Um, I, I actually feel like um, the waiting room was very misunderstood. Um, I, I had a conversation with the Guardian reporter who was our, our critic who kept on asking me about medical statistics. I was starting to get invited to panels about medical apartheid or, um, and, you know, which is something I actually know nothing about. So I felt like um, I wanted to talk about waiting after having done the Free People's Medical Clinic and kind of gotten it out of my system. I mean, I, I definitely wanted to continue thinking about um, the relationship of, of, of the black body to medicine, but I also um, wanted to think about waiting as a um, psychological preoccupation of black women, as the socio-political status, um, as a description of our bodies. I wanted to think about waiting and I wanted to think about expand this idea of medicine to include things like herbalism or to include things like getting advice from Lorraine and things are, you know, Vanessa talking about toxicity and body burdens. I thought that it was pretty obvious and we also wrote a lot about it in the broadside, but it didn't come across and that was disappointing to me. Um, it was disappointing to realize that, I mean, it's that kind of big elaborate project, I think it's harder for me to control. Um, and so um, I struggle with that. Yeah. When I think about misunderstanding, I think about but the piece that I mentioned to, to you, art is, you know, art is was very, I talk, I talk about my work as writing in space. And so uh, the whole Mademoiselle Bourgeois Noir project for me was an essay. I do some poetry. I, the, the one that you liked so much and wrote about uh, was a, what I would call a novel in space, right? But, this, but Mademoiselle Bourgeois Noir was an essay in space. And, uh, and after she finished shouting and did realize it's not gonna really cut it, uh, she started figuring out other ways to make the same point. But they were all essays as far as I was concerned. So there was the black and white show, which was a, which was a way of saying which artists should be included, right? You know, so it had 50% black, 50% white artists. And then I did another one, which was another piece, which was about who who should be in the audience, who should be part of this audience. And I decided to take avant-garde art to the biggest place I could think of, which was a parade. And I, you know, and I did this parade in in uh, Har Harlem with the, the parade float uh, called Art Is, and um, and uh, yes, when I did the documentation of it. And I made it into a piece. Yes, there were a lot of joyous people, <laughs> right? Uh, but uh, I had actually started the the the, the, the documentation uh, for p um, the, the, the the installation uh, with pieces that puzzled me and that disturbed me, you know. And and so, so there, was, there was a lot more in that documentation than people seem to see. You know, they all seem to see like happy folks, right? <laughs> Okay, and, and I would say that, uh, <laughs> I would say that somehow or the other, as a result of having done that piece, for several years I've been thought of as a social practice artist, you know. Not as somebody who was making an essay argument, you know, but whatever. <laughs> whatever. The clock is just about run down. Um, do either of you have a question for each other or something that you, we haven't covered that you'd love to? It's really hard for us. It's I mean, hard. It's really hard. Scared. It's so hard to talk we, uh, in a format like yeah, this because we talk all the time. We talk in a all the time, way. and so it's a little bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> we have to ask questions. Well,
Well, we'll, <laughs> we'll end it really awkwardly then and <laughs> say, um, but, but honestly, this is um, a huge honor to have you both here and to help celebrate um, our 40th anniversary. Thank you both very much. Thank you for having me.